Hi, I'm Andrew Mercado, and I'm here with Alan Coleman, the producer of The Young Doctors, and I think you wrote this episode too, didn't you, Alan? Yep, and I think I was due to write this one, but I've just noticed that it was actually... Uh, direct this one, but I've just noticed it was directed by Rusty Buckley, which is interesting because not only did we make a, a rule that we were going to use new and unseen talent on this show, uh, but we are also going to bring people up through the ranks as directors... And Rusty was actually our second uh, assistant director. Nice. And we brought him up and trained him to be a director, and this is one of his first episodes. Because this is quite late in the run, episode 1077, um, and I guess passing the 1,000 is always a milestone, isn't it? It's always a milestone. I managed to convince them that we should have some sort of a party. They weren't too happy about um, giving us a 500th because... We were in, Reg Watson and myself were involved with Crossroads, which ran forever. And at the thousandth party for Crossroads in England, we asked the Luger if we could have a party. And being a West End Jewish gentleman, he turned around and said, but if we have a party for the thousandth, they'll want one every thousand. <laughs> and I think it rubbed off a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, no, we, we did. We had a good party. But you guys were renowned for having great parties, and, and I've always wondered if that was because the rap party that you were having when you thought it was going to be the end of the show after 13 weeks, actually turned into the renewal party. Yep, it was a wake and um, turned out to be a wedding when we all got married again, um, together. Uh, yes, now, after 13 weeks, the, um, the network decided to can it, although I had always said that I knew it had got legs for at least seven years. I knew it had got legs for seven years. But you can't throw a programme, no matter how much research you do, you can't throw a programme on air and expect the public to accept it without giving it time, mm. you know. And you deliberately go out of your way to spend a lot of time to develop the characters, to make people want to see them more and want to find out more about them. You can't do that in 13 weeks. But they canned it, and we were having the wake, which was the rap party, and I don't know, the few comments were made by various people, including myself, because I'd had a bit too much to drink, and, <laughs> and it was announced that, in fact, the programme was going to be given a second series of 13 weeks and see where it went from there. Now, back at when this was, you started in December 1976, nine were actually trying out two serials that summer. They were trying out The Young Doctors and they were trying out The Sullivans. Sullivans. And, of course, they, they loved The Sullivans because the critics loved it and it was, it was such a critical success. But they sort of decided that The Young Doctors wasn't kind of up to scratch. But what do you think went on? Do you think they really did do some private surveys there? I know Gwen Plum said in her autobiography that she was kind of... People were coming up to her in the street saying, we love that new show you're in. And But, I mean, networks don't usually rescind decisions like that. When the axe falls, it usually falls. But obviously something had happened there for them to realise that, hey, they were making a mistake. I've got a feeling that... Reg Grundy probably had a, a, a lot. Reg didn't really have a lot of contact with the networks. He would leave that to his executives. But Reg Grundy was well known for knowing the facts and knowing that what was going to work. That's why all his programmes were so successful. Yeah. And I have a feeling, and don't quote me on this, but I have a feeling that it was pressure from the Grundy organisation, please give us another chance. You know, and I'd said that, and... Um, I'd been involved in long-running serials in England. I knew the Crossroads was going to work. I knew this had got legs for... Mm. Um, I knew that Class of 74 would have legs for four or five years, went into Class of 75, and the format changed. Mm. Um, so that became a new show. But, uh, no, I think we... Somebody, and I'm sure it was the organisation with Reg at the helm, that convinced Nine, Linton Taylor... Look, just give it another one. Give people, you know, six months to get to know our people, to get to find out their stories, who they are, what they're up to, what they can expect. And giving people what they want. Mm. You know, let them know that what they're going to see is births, deaths, marriages and gossip, and that's all they want to see in five nights a week, fast turnaround. And yeah. that's what we wanted to give them, and we did. Do you think when that decision was made to keep the show going that... Yeah, the, the decision was made to keep it at a sort of a rock-bottom price because The Young Doctors is renowned for being, well, not the most expensive production ever made in Australia, shall we say. You kind of did it all on the smell of an oily rag. It was done on a shoestring. It was done on a shoestring, but I personally love that because you've got to make something better, you know, out of very little money mm. in order to make it sell and make it work. So 
Um, it doesn't cost anything to work well with artists and encourage artists and to direct them and get the best out of them and to produce good stories. That doesn't cost anything at all. Mm. It's the things like the sets and that. I mean, we're looking at, you know, how many rooms do we see in there? I mean, we all know now that you know, probably three or four sets and yeah. we just change them every, every, every time we stop doing a scene, they would change it into a, the casualty would become some ward. This, this particular episode, Andrew, was, was full of cliffhangers. Normally, on a normal episode, you would have a cliffhanger, which would involve one of the stories you'd been watching during the week. Because this was an episode designed to show at the end of the Christmas period, just before Christmas, and you were going to have a break until the rating started again in February, we knew that we got to give them plenty to hang on to to make them want to come back in February. So what we did, we give a series of cliffhangers, you know, four or five of the probably most popular at that time artists would begin the cliffhanger. Um, Dennis um, and, and the new baby, mm. they were being very popular. Peter Holland and um, Peter Bensley, his character was Dr. Newman. Do yes. Dr. Newman. Um, so you've got, you've got the stabbing. Uh, the murderer that's been going around, we find out that um, is it his brother or not? You'll have to wait till February to find out. The baby, um, it's not their baby. You've got to wait till February to find out if it is. You've got the cholera outbreak. Who is it that's in there? Is Peter Holland involved in that or does he know? So we have all these cliffhangers. So instead of just aiming at one group of the population that like that particular group of people, we've given each and every one of those groups their own cliffhanger. Now, this was all very planned to run at the end of the year, but unfortunately the nine schedule cricket would start creeping into the schedule around this time of year, and sometimes the, the Christmas cliffhangers didn't quite make it to air because of the cricket. No, when we did the planning, which was done a few weeks in advance, we unfortunately couldn't plan what matches were going to be <laughs> um, played in the one-day series that yeah. nine have put a lot of money and effort into. So, yes, I mean, I, I've... But then it wasn't this particular year, but one particular year, I was mortified when our cliffhangers went out the first week of the uh, new ratings period in February. But whether or not it um, didn't work for us, I don't know. I know one thing, that the ratings that week and the next week were probably higher than we'd ever had at the start of a new ratings period. Yeah. When the show in Australia used to screen, did it screen before Channel 9 News? Was it sort of a 6pm show? 6.30. 6.30. 6.30 to 7. So it would screen after the news. Yeah. Right. Talking about using people, I think that's one of our writers, Ian Coglin, that was in there. <laughs> yeah, that's Ian Coglin. Lying in the bed as a patient. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, we did... Uh... Oh, he even gets a close-up. Yes, he probably wrote that interview <laughs> in the episode. And look how young ja Jackie Woodburn is I here. I mean, she's I still in Neighbours today. She's a, yes. she's a stalwart in Neighbours. Yep. Would yep. this have been one of her first roles? I think it probably was, because, as I say, a, a lot of the people you look at in this show, it was their first role, because yeah. we deliberately set out to do that. And um, it, it, one of the reasons that we trained new people to, to direct was because, to be absolutely honest, there weren't that many directors around that could actually cope with the pressures of five nights a week fast turnaround television and still produce something that was watchable. Mm. Um, and that's not a criticism, it's a statement of fact that it's a totally different discipline. Exactly the same as performers, artists. It's a different kettle of fish doing two and a half hours of drama a week and making it believable than doing half an hour a week when you've got all that extra time for rehearsal and all that extra time for plotting everything and dotting every I and looking at every little tiny idiosyncratic motivation thing, you know. Mm. You don't have time. You've got to make it work by doing your homework, get in there, do it, and move on. So w w let's talk about how much rehearsal these guys actually would have. Would rehearsal more or less be a run-through, a blocking for the camera? Was that basically the only rehearsal they got? No, we'd have a day totally with the director and the artists in the uh, on the on the Friday, I think, it doesn't matter what day it was, we'd have a whole day yep. rehearsing, blocking every um, every scene for the in, in every episode for the week, that's five. I made a definite decision as producer to record in sequence 
because there's big problems maintaining your critical path if you don't record in sequence so it doesn't build as you perform mm. it. But that's unusual. You know, most people sort of just film in that set all the scenes and then leave it to the editor to spice it all together. That's right. And now they're getting used to that. That's, but, but I did not give in to that selfish thought and it is a selfish thought that we are the important ones as far as I was concerned the actors are the important mm. ones and to help them through this and let, let's face it it was a new thing people really weren't sure how to handle it we had been involved in it and we picked up the tips how to handle it and that's why Crossroads was recorded right up until I think well certainly until I left it was certainly in sequence. In sequence, wow. And and that was a deliberate thing. We stopped, we did this scene, and then we'd get ready for the next scene, and, which followed on. Yeah. So these people knew, Helen knew exactly what had gone on before this. Yeah, right. And she knew how to react. They, She knew what the relationship with this girl was. Yep. Whereas if you record this on a Friday afternoon when you've had the other scene on a Monday morning, you know, how do you work out your career yeah. path? And see, of course, a lot of the soaps today, they've got one week doing in studio and then they're doing next week's episodes on location. location. So the actors flit back and forth between the yep. two things. In the school that I have, that's one thing that I do teach, mm. how to work a critical path through your script. There is a way of doing it. But we didn't have time to even talk about it in those days. So that's what we did. Now, um, for, for a 6.30 family time slot, a lot of drinking went on, didn't it? Oh, a lot. Pour a drink at the bar. Every yeah. every crisis could be fixed by, give me a drink. I know. I don't think you'd get away with that today, would you? Oh, no. No, no, no. no th oh, things have changed a lot. You know, you get more sort of raunchy television at that time of night now, but a lot less drinking and certainly no smoking. No. But rehearsal, no. They'd have a full day rehearsing with just the actors and the director. Yep. And then they would follow that with, I would have a producer's run and I would stand back and watch it and make notes. We then, on the studio days, we would have a rehearsal, which the cameras would watch, and we'd, um, we'd block it. You were quite right, we'd block it. We'd then have another rehearsal, giving notes. We'd then go for a final rehearsal, and then a take. Wow. We would, we would very rarely go for a complete take two. Um, we would more often than not do a pickup if there was something that uh, needed... Um, did redo. We did do take two, did take two, three, four sometimes. Yeah. But um, I did encourage the actors, and I'm, I still encourage people when I'm directing these days. I don't care whether it's on television, you know, you're an actor, and the actors have to perform in front of live audiences. Don't get into the habit of turning around because you lose your lines and saying that word. Saying the swear word to stuff it up. And, and yeah. Exactly. Um, I say stay in character, mm. hold the eye line of the artist. Mm. And we will give it to you exactly the same as a prompt in the theater and then we can edit that bit out yeah the good thing about doing that and i try to tell actors is you can actually remain in focus and so can the camera people it's funny as we do this because we need to stop for the commercial breaks because, you know, we're doing this audio commentary and there's gaps in between. But we, we're just laughing then. We could actually tell by the music that we were heading for a commercial break, or you could recognise it, couldn't you, Alan? It's what I call a commercial break sting. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny, this, in this world of fast turnaround, five nights a week, fast turnaround television, um, I'm, I'm going to publish my book one of these days called The Alan Coleman Look of, Book of Soap Opera Looks because we actually got to the stage where I would seriously say to the actors, Chris King, Dennis... Dennis, can you give me look 48? Because we got to know what the looks were. And the, uh, look, the look being the look to go out to a freeze frame for the commercial break. Whatever. Yeah. That, that would have been look 102. Yeah. <laughs> look 102 because he'd just thrown the glass across against the wall and it was the softest wall I've ever heard a glass hit. I'm not quite sure what <laughs> it did hit. But we do, and this is why I tended to stay in sequence, we do use a form of verbal shorthand when directing and... That's why um, I think it's important for actors because there is more and more television happening, although it's a lot of reality now. Mm. But I do t like keep trying to remind them that they are an actor. It was Sir Luke Raid, one of my great mentors, that said to me, Alan, don't get technical in your direction and don't let your actors go out of character because... The only reason we've got television is because people nowadays can't afford 
can't afford to go to the theatre or can't be bothered to go to the theatre. We are taking theatre into their home. Mm -hmm. So that's always been at the back of my mind. We're, t we're doing theatre. And if things go wrong on a stage, you get yourself out of it. Mm. It's nice to have that little, you know, ability to be able to do a take yes. two or do a pickup. But normally the first take is a good one if they treat it as a stage yeah, performance. Yeah, and that's right. On the stage, you've got to make a mistake work, haven't you? There's no exactly. second chance there. No. One of the things I've noticed in producing these DVDs is uh, any actor that is associated with this show really, really loves it. And it says to me that it must have been a really happy working environment. Sure, it was tough. I know the dressing rooms were, were a bit dodgy and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, everyone that was in this show absolutely loved it. And in particular, many of them have named you. Um, in particular, I think of Joanne Samuel, who talks about how great you were to release her to go make the movie Mad Max. She had a contract, she, but you know, Rosie Bailey was meant to pay Mel Gibson's wife and I think she broke a leg or something, but the part got off to Joanne and you immediately released her from the contract to go make that movie. The five nights a week fast turnaround television is like real life. And unfortunately in real life, people die. I mean, I've had people die, you know, on my serials. Um, so you can always, rewrite a story very quickly in order to do that. I did that in Shortland Street for um, uh, Once Were Warriors. Um, Tamura Morrison. Tem, Tem Morrison. He wanted time out to go and do Once Were Warriors. I gave him time out and, and I'm always prepared to do that. I mean, it's their career. Yeah. And I mean, I'm not going to say, I've got you under contract, I'm going to hold you to contract, I, I, unless they were involved in a really big storyline. But let's face it, life, is stranger than fiction. So in fiction, it's very easy to suddenly find a twist that will make that big storyline you're about to do become an even stronger storyline by having a twist in it and somebody dying on or somebody disappearing. Yeah. So you capitalise on your disadvantages. Mm. You turn into advantages. So, no, I be, and I deliberately set out to, um, on any show I work on, to let them know that I'm dad, I'm, I'm father, my door's always open. Come and talk to me about any problem you have to do with the work or personal, I don't care. Um, I think if anything, I go out of my way to promote a family atmosphere. Mm. Um, I can speak to who the hell you mentioned. I mean, Princess Alexander, I met showing around Crossroads. And to me, a person is a person is a person. And I've got respect for them. And if you have respect for them and show you've got respect for them, they'll have respect for you. Absolutely. And it then works. Mm. And it's like if any father, um, son, daughter relationship works, if the kids know they can come and talk to dad about anything. Mm. And these people knew they could come and talk to me about anything. Yeah. And as such, it did have a family atmosphere. Working under dreadful conditions, the studios, no air conditioning, you know, three changes of clothing before you got a take done. Mm. Um, you know, it, it's just, the nearest thing I can liken it to is my experiences during the war in England where you lived virtually in the underground tunnels in London <laughs> and you just made the most of it. Yeah. And you got, you said, well, this is how it's got to be. Let's make the most of what we've got. Yeah. And I deliberately set out to encourage them to give the best yeah. at all time. The, the end result, though, is that this is probably the cheapest but most successful drama ever in the history of Australian television. There probably hasn't been a drama that's run for this many episodes sure. and been this high rating that was probably made for so little. And obviously it, the, the actors were happy in that environment because of what you created there with your family feel. Or they wouldn't have stayed. A lot of these actors were very long running, weren't they? They were long running. They yeah. Were. Most of them only ever left if they did get an offer for a film or something. But you see, going back to what Sir Lou Grade said, you know, don't worry too much about the sets, especially in television, because it is a medium of the close up. Yep. Just it's it's what is filling that screen, which is the face, what they're saying, yeah. how they're saying it, and what they've got to say. That's really what matters. Yes. So give people, you know, R rubbish, sets rubbish, this rubbish, that. 
I think for, I think providing you've got strong enough stories, good enough performances, people don't really care what's going yeah. on around. Around they don't look to see what's around it. They're concentrating on what's happening. Now this was an amazing turnaround for Caroline. Her character Jill Rand. I mean, she came in as a real glamour puss back That's in the right. early early days of the show. Yep. And then you brought her back after she'd had a suicide attempt and turned her into this mousy character. That's an interesting turn. Did you see something in Jill Rand that you thought she yes. had the quality for a long running? Yes. What happened was we brought her in as a particular character and fine, she coped with that character. But as I got to know the girl more and more, I knew that there was an underlying character that she could play and, and would love to play, so we discussed it with her. Then we found out how we could make that character work you know, and in fact, that became one of our strongest relationships, one yeah. of our stronger relationships with Dennis and uh, and her. And and she she much much preferred this and was much better at this than being the glamour puss behind mm. the desk, which is how we brought her in. Oh dear, here goes the collar. <laughs> and I know we're not seeing her in this episode, but if you were dad, was Glenn Plum Mum on the set? Did she take on the role of mum? Yes, yes, yes. Because Gwen, because she's such a professional lady she would make a point of passing on anything she could to these to these um, younger actors yeah and she would take them under her wing and so yep mum dad not a real baby there um i'd probably have to say no <laughs> <laughs> no it's the wrong baby anyway yeah yeah it's not her baby because it's a mannequin <laughs> Good cliffhanger. We must be getting very close to... Now, he's been stabbed? Oh, well, here we go. That's the end. That's and the end. And that's... Wait till 1978, but here on the DVD, you can go straight to the next episode. So we've got to wind up. Look, Alan Coleman, great to chat to you. I know the fans will have loved what you had to tell them there. Oh, good. Very, very interesting stuff. And um, we look forward to seeing your next release, Class of 74, soon. Oh, the drama well, you did before The Young Doctor that's soon. That's right, that's right. Class of 74, yep. Long-running serials, five nights a week. That's me. Yeah, great to talk to you, Alan Coleman. I'm Andrew Mercado, and uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Andrew.